First thing I would suggest to you is I just want to get a feeling here. How many people here are actually graduating this fall at the end of this term? Okay, one. How about in the spring? Okay, a few more. Great. I would say, especially for the fall, if you haven't done so already, but especially for the spring now, is that you really want to start monitoring the job postings as they come out. Take a look as far as what kinds of jobs are being offered, where they're being offered. Uh, I think that it gives you a good idea as far as how the market is going. So it's never too early, even though you may not be applying until the spring, to look at the job market. And <clears throat> other people who might even be graduating next year, if you're graduating, let's see, a year from this December, if you see jobs that are offered in the spring, that's not too early to take a look. Because what you can do is by the time you apply for the jobs, you tell them in your cover letter that you're going to be graduating in the fall. By the time things start, it may actually coincide very nicely with your graduation that there may be a job there. So always kind of think ahead at least six months when you're looking for those projective jobs. The other thing I'm going to tell you is that uh, if you're going to stay in the Bay Area, and a lot of you know this, that the job market, in particular for academic librarians, is very, very tight. And that's just because you look at the number of people in the school, you look at the people who are interested in academic jobs, and you look at the number of openings that are in academic institutions, and you do the math. There aren't a lot of positions that are going to open up right away. So what you need to decide is a couple of things. One is there may be temporary positions that open up. You may be part of a job pool, for example, to substitute for librarians. Or there may be an op uh, a job that is for two years because it's part of a contract. And you may decide that might be a good kind of foot in the door if you want to stay in the area to get the experience, get the working knowledge, and then when a full-time job opens up, you've got that background and you've got that experience that you can put on your resume. The other thing I've seen people do is they opt to leave the area for two or three years, get the experience outside the area, and then when a job opens up, come back, they've got the experience. The one thing I will say is take a look as far as where the job is. If, for example, you're not thrilled about living in the South, you probably don't want to apply for jobs that are in Alabama, Mississippi, or Louisiana. If the Midwest is fine, then go there. But take a look to see where the jobs are and think about possibly relocating for two or three years and then coming back in the process. Another thing I would encourage you to do if you haven't done so already is look for networking opportunities with professionals while you're still a student. And in particular, if it's things like volunteering or working with a local organization, whether it's SLA, part of CARL, part of PLA, if you're a public librarian or interested in public libraries. But also on top of that, the other thing you want to think about is going to conferences as a student. And I would encourage you, especially those people graduating this year, is if you haven't thought about going to ALA in Seattle or ACRL in Baltimore, a lot of times there are scholarships that are there. And I would encourage you to look for those scholarships. Uh, that's one way where, again, you can kind of get in the door, be able to network with the professionals and get an idea. I find that the most beneficial thing for me going to conferences is that networking. And I think especially as students looking for professional opportunities, conferences are a great place to take a look. Because again, a lot of times too, is you talk to somebody else who's got a job opening, they remember you, they were very impressed, and you've got that link or network right there. If you're not at those professional meetings or you don't have those opportunities, then again, that's going to be something that you, uh, in hindsight, would have wanted to participate in. Another thing to realize is that how many people here actually work right now in the library as a support staff person? Okay, a few of you. Uh, one thing I'll mention is that depending on the library, sometimes libraries don't like to hire from within. In other words, what they say for their support staff is that we'd rather you go out and get some experience elsewhere, get a different feel for a different kind of library before you come back and hire at that library. So, it's not true for every library, but I've had some experience with academic libraries where I've been working as a librarian. I've seen support staff encouraged to go to library school, and then when an opening comes up, they're told, well, we'd really like you to go out and learn some, a different library first before you think about coming on back. So 
just be aware of the fact that sometimes there is a little bit of a bias there for kind of hiring uh, within from support staff position to a professional position. The job application process. This is probably one of the most stressful things that people go through. I know when I was applying for jobs, it's stressful because especially when you want to get that first professional position. So a couple of things. One that I, and I am regularly part of job screening committees is please read the job description thoroughly. That to me is probably one of the biggest mistakes I see people submitting applications. If we're hiring for a department head, and you send in your application here right out of library school, we're going to put it right away. We know what pilot goes in. And, but we see those all the time. People don't look. They look at the locations like, oh, I really want to work for San Jose State, or I really want to work for you know, Santa Clara or University of San Francisco, whatever it is, and they don't thoroughly read the job description. Really important, please read the job description thoroughly. The things you want to look for in particular is what's preferred versus what's recommended. Two different things. Typically, you'll see what's recommended and preferred um, right below the actual requirements. So when you apply for those, look at those things to see, do I have any of those skills, any of that knowledge that's in that recommended or preferred area that would put me maybe a cut above another applicant in the pool? As far as requirements go, this is where they, the hiring library must, or if they're doing it legally, legally, must meet these requirements. So for example, if they say must have two years of experience as a professional librarian, it means they shouldn't be interviewing anybody who doesn't have those professional years of experience. So typically what you'll see sometimes is very fuzzy kind of descriptions and job. They'll say, well, we'd like two years of experience, but we'll uh, also take you know, working as a library assistant in a library as acceptable. Or they'll say, we'll take uh, looking at um, subject expertise, for example, let's say you've got a second master's in a different discipline, they may come back and say, well, as long as you have an interest or as long as you have some background in this subject area, then we'll go ahead and look at your application. So again, look at the requirements and then look at those preferred and recommended areas to see if there's something there that kind of catches your eye that will put you, again, a cut above some of those other applicants. Letters of reference. I had the opportunity um, last year to write a letter of reference for someone who actually graduated from the San Jose program and had gone up to Portland with his partner temporarily to work part-time as a librarian and wanted to come back to the Bay Area after his partner got his uh, master's degree. And he asked me before he left, would you mind giving me a letter of reference for my file that I can then use when I apply for positions in the future? And I told him, and I will tell you this, don't do it. And there's a reason for that. And that is that if you have a generic letter that's written by your current employer or from a professor, and you just keep that in your file and you use it time after time, it's going to be very evident to the people reviewing the applications, this is just a canned letter because it doesn't really talk about the strengths you would bring to a particular position. So what I told him and what I would encourage you to do is to find people who will write you a letter when you need the letter. So exact, in this case, I can then, when he told me he was applying, I could say, okay, I'm happy to write the letter and I can highlight what his skills would bring to that specific position. And it turns out he actually got the position over at Cal State East Bay. So again, try to avoid the temptation of having those kind of letters of reference in a file. See if you can't get an agreement with an employer or a professor to write the letter that's particular to the job that you're interested in. Second, if you're going to have a letter and you're currently working, try to get at least one of your letters from a current supervisor, someone who immediately supervises you. And that's because typically what's going to happen during the job interview, if you haven't listed your current supervisor as a reference, the question is going to become, can we contact your current supervisor for, for, for an additional reference? So to kind of avoid that, I would encourage you immediately to put that person at kind of at the top of your list 
to see if you can't get your current supervisor to write you a letter of recommendation when you're applying for those jobs. If you don't now work in a library, but you're now working in the corporate world, um, what I would recommend is it depends on what you're doing. If there are skills that you're using in the corporate world that transfer over to librarianship, absolutely. For example, let's say you're doing project management. That could really easily transfer over to a library position. Or let's say you've got computer skills that, again, are in the corporate world. Those might transfer over. So think of are there transferable skills from your current position, even though it's not strictly a library position, can it transfer over? So think about that also. If it's something that's totally unrelated and you're working part-time there, let's say you're you know, a barista at Starbucks, well, of course not. I mean, that's not going to do you any good. But again, for a lot of the jobs people have part-time or even maybe even full-time, those are ones where, again, you can use those skills and, and show what you can do. <laughs> yeah, being a barista at Starbucks, that's true. You could, that could be a demonstration as far as your customer service skills. So yeah, absolutely. That may actually be an example of how you would use that and have someone to write a letter as far as how well you've done with, uh, working with customers or especially maybe unruly customers or in a very stressful environment. Because again, a lot of times when we talk about the interview process, there are several questions that seem to always come up when I've done interviews. And people come up with these questions, and typically one of the questions is, we ask the candidates, how do you deal with a stressful situation? Or how do you deal with difficult situation or a difficult person? To see what their interpersonal skills are like. So that is a good example of how someone might be able to, to write that in a, uh, a letter of reference for you. It's completely dependent upon the letter writer uh, as far as who, what kind of letter they're writing for you. Uh, the letter could include both positive and negative, or it could also include those that are positive. So if someone's writing you a letter and uh, you can't tell them necessarily whether both elements are going to be positive or negative, they may just write and include both aspects. They may say these are strengths that you have. They may say that these are weaknesses that you have. Uh, sometimes also it may just be a phone call. So they won't necessarily have, write a letter, but they'll say, well, I'm going to follow up with a phone reference. And again, they're going to ask questions where they may actually say, what is the weakness of this individual versus what is the strength of that individual? So it's usually going to get a combination of both kinds of things in a letter, both the positives and the negatives. Typically, no. Um, uh, it depends if I'm a... I will say there's a couple of times where I'm very friendly with somebody that I might want to send them to them, but a lot of times the employer would prefer you not send a copy of the letter of reference to the applicant. Um, somehow people think it may taint the search process somewhat, so typically you won't get it. But if you know the reference really well, I think it's one thing you can do is just sit down with them and say, you know, what are my strengths, what are my weaknesses, you know, kind of get an idea of what kind of letter they're going to write for you or what kind of reference they're going to be with you in kind of a pre-interview mode before you even start putting out your applications there. After letter of references, the other thing that's going to stand out is the cover letter that you sent. And this is something where I've seen everything from two lines to three pages. And what I would recommend is probably one page at the most, maybe a little bit more. And in the cover letter, this is where, depending on the job, you want to highlight what skills you bring to that particular job. So again, read the job description, try to figure out, okay, what can I bring to this job, and highlight those elements in your cover letter. So after you're done reading the cover letter, someone can say, ah, this candidate's got these three skills, we really need these. Put it aside, look at next, the resume, and kind of go forward. So cover letter, very, very important. After the cover letter, the resume. One of the things I recommend with people with a resume is if you've got prior experience that you think is relevant, 
on your initial resume, I would say go ahead and list it. So for example, if you're working in that corporate world that's not a library position, you might want to list what you do there. Again, what skills can you list there that you've learned or that you've used that might be applicable that I could scan there and say, well, this person you know, knows all about how to design web pages or this person knows all about um, using certain software programs. So there might be elements that you can include there in the resume. After you've been in the job field for a while though, as you get more and more experience, you can probably drop off and not include that non-librarian related work experience in your resume. So again, your resume will change over time, not only in the job you've done, but also it's going to change in the sense that uh, you're going to drop off some things that are not as quite as important for the job that you're currently applying for. Things like are you a library page? Absolutely. For your first resume, I think it's absolutely re uh, relevant. Things that sometimes people forget is your internship. That's one of those things where you've learned a lot of those skills. You may have worked on specific projects. Make sure that you include that experience as, you know, kind of work experience. Although technically, obviously, it was coursework because you got credit for it. But again, put, make sure you put that in your resume. So I can see, for example, if I get your application, oh, this person's worked in an academic library and they've worked in a special library. So I know that they've got experience in both those areas. So think about including the internship information in the resume. And obviously, if someone's a library assistant, absolutely. If you've been a library assistant for a while, put that information there. Even though, let's say you did it 10 years ago and then you took another job and now you're coming back to the library world, it helps to know that you at least have some experience working in a library. So always use that to your advantage, especially when you're applying for your first jobs there. Things that I feel an incoming librarian should have as far as skills that I look for, uh, one of the things that we're always looking for are things like flexibility. Uh, people who come in and realize that uh, there's jobs that go beyond 9 to 5. So for example, people who work a 12 to, to 9 shift with an hour off in between. Or people who have a variety of shifts because of teaching loads. So when you're looking, when I'm looking for people, I want to see that flexibility. I also want to see a breadth in the kind of classwork you took. So I don't necessarily want to see a transcript. Some places will ask for a transcript depending on the institution. Some universities may ask for that. But I really want to see what courses you took, what kind of knowledge did you gain from those courses that, again, might apply to a position uh, in my library. Um, one of the things is how many people here are interested in being a reference librarian of some sort? Anybody? Oh, quite a few people. Okay. Out of those people, how many of you have taken cataloging and classification? Okay. Those who didn't raise your hand, if you can take it, take it. And the reason why is because I find some of the best reference librarians have the knowledge of how the catalog works and how information is organized in the library. And therefore, skills like cataloging and classification, even though you're not going to be a cataloger, it sure helps to find information knowing how it's going to be organized. So I would encourage you, if you have an interest in reference, think about taking a course in cataloging and classification.